Okay, uh, I think we can start. So hello everyone, um, I'm Diewert, I'm going to play the host tonight. Um, so welcome to the discussion on uh, the USA Rebellion. Um, if you encounter any problems, if you don't hear me or anything, please let us know in the comments. Um, pour ceux qui veulent suivre en français, vous pouvez aussi uh, suivre le, le webinaire sur Zoom. Une fois que vous l'avez, une fois que vous avez ouvert Zoom sur le, le fond de l'écran, juste à côté de share screen, il y a un bouton interprétation. Euh, Assurez-vous que vous, la, vous appuyez dessus pour euh, entendre l'interprétation. Um, if you have any questions, you can use the Q&A button also on the bottom of the screen. Um, if, so make sure that if you have any questions, you ask them by that button and not any other way. Uh, this question will later be collected and addressed after each speaker had some time to react and uh, make their points. Um, so this conference has been organized by uh, La Gauche Anticapitalist of Stroming for an Anticapitalist Project. Uh, it's a revolutionary and anti-capitalist organization from Belgium, which is also bilingual, so in Dutch and French. Uh, and it's also a section of the Ford International. Uh, this has also been made possible with the support of a lot of partner anti-capitalist organizations, such as Nouveau Parti Anticapitaliste from France, uh, Solidarité from Switzerland, SAP Grenzelos from the Netherlands, BFS Mouvement pour le Socialisme en Suisse from Switzerland also, and Socialist Resistance from Great Britain. So, as we all know, the past few months have been accompanied by huge movements in the US, which also had a lot of impacts across the world with um, supports of solidarity, show movements of solidarity to the Black Lives Matter movement going from countries like Syria to, um, to Hong Kong. Um, the country has been dramatically impacted by the pandemic, the presidency of Donald Trump, which is pretty extreme right and the social and economic crisis that followed. Uh, the country also saw rebirth of some sorts of the Black Lives Matter movement and the anti-racist movement for social justice and against police violence, which has also sparked movements in other countries to take back on the struggle. Um, this all broke out after the horrifying video came out of the murder of George Floyd. So now the question arises for all of us, where is the USA going? And uh, to discuss this, we have two wonderful panelists uh, from the radical left. So first up is Titi Bhattacharya. Uh, she's an historian from Purdue University in Indiana. She's a Marxist feminist, one of the organizers of the International Women's Strike of 2017, co-author of the Manifesto Feminism for the 99%, as well as several key books on the theory of social reproduction. And she's also the co-editor of the Marxist magazine Spectre, which is honestly a great read. So if you have any time, feel free to look into that. So also with us is Malik Mia. Uh, he's a trade unionist and anti-racist activist, a retired aircraft mechanic, and a member of the editorial board of the Anti-Capitalist Journal Against the Current. Um, so thank you very much, both of you, for joining us today. Um, each of you will have around 20 minutes uh, to present yourself and make your points. So once again, if you, anyone has any questions, feel free to use the Q&A button um, of, to comment those. Um, after each speaker has had some time, we'll um, give them some time to react to each other, and then we'll address the questions. So um, if everything's OK, Titi, you may start. Thank you, comrade. Um, first of all, thank you to all the comrades for putting this um, conference together and um, this is a very important and urgent conversation and thank you for inviting me on it thank you very much to the translator comrades who are doing the hard job of translating simultaneously as we speak and of course um, thank you to all of you listening in i'm going to start by i suppose talking about what has been achieved first, just to give you a sense of the breadth and depth of this uprising. So if you are in the US and you open Amazon page, 
uh, Jeff Bezos has put a banner on Amazon saying Black Lives Matter. This is a company where the vast majority of Black people uh, are not paid enough to put body and soul together. And uh, it is, and while Jeff Bezos is one of the richest people on the earth, on the planet, but he feels compelled to put Black Lives Matter on the banner. Every bank has come out with statements on how Black Lives is very important. So JP Morgan Chase, uh, you know, uh, um, American Express, everybody is telling me that they have always been in support of Black Lives and Black Lives Matter is very important. So the ruling class is scared that this rebellion will have a much greater reach than just toppling of statues. The political class is divided there is Trump on one hand who basically wants to mow down all the protesters, especially people of color, but there is um, a significant part of the political class that wants to contain and co-opt the protests. So this is the situation as it stands. The achievements are so many that we should talk about it more as uh, in, during the Q&A, but I wanna name some significant ones. Mm -hmm. Finally, in my lifetime, there is a delegitimization of Confederate flags and statues. So not only are statues being pulled down, but the ruling class is so scared that it is actually removing these statues of slavers and slave owners, including museum in New York, removed the statue of Theodore Roosevelt, which I never thought I would see in, in my lifetime, which is fantastic. Um, there is also significant uh, movement to remove police unions from labor unions, um, local labor unions. Um, and there is a significant move to remove the police and the presence of the police from schools and hospitals. And I will talk about each of these in turn. So those are simply the, um, the effects that this uprising of just a few weeks has had, which is not a surprise to Marxists listening in, but to a new generation of protesters, this again brings to uh, bear the enormous power that collective action can have. So having said that, I wanna clarify two things. I don't think we should see these as a collection of anti-racist protests. This is an uprising and that is the name that we should give to it. There have now been protests in more than 1600 towns and cities in the United States. In my own town, which is part industrial and part university town, and the, with, a, with a population count of only 100,000, tear gas was used uh, to dispel protesters. The number of locations where protests have taken place has more than doubled since the first week of June. Hundreds of protests mark Juneteenth, the day that remembers the end of slavery in the US. And in a significant development, the Union of Dock Workers, the International Longshore and Warehouse Union, stopped work to honor Juneteenth. This is a specifically anti-racist inflection on a strike or work stoppage, and the political nature of this cannot be stressed enough. There is, as I said, a growing movement to kick police out of schools, hospitals, and labor unions in Seattle. They actually succeeded. Uh, my comrade and friend, Jesse Hagopian, uh, who's one of the founding members of uh, Black Lives Matter at schools, was successfully, uh, has successfully organized to pass a resolution that police will no longer be allowed on school campuses in Seattle and the police union has been kicked out of the Seattle Labor Council. In Portland and Seattle, protesters have set up autonomous zones, which are police-free zones and are run by ordinary people in a collective and democratic manner. 
There is something else that you will see when you look at the nature of the uprising. You will see nurses helping protesters um, deal with um, uh, rubber bullet wounds and tear gas. You will see protesters wearing face masks to actually protect each other, bringing water and food to help out fellow protesters. What we are seeing right now play out is a fierce and necessary struggle between what I call life-making and death-making, which is what capitalism is famous for. So since I write about social reproduction and my work is mostly around those struggles, I think I need to explain what social reproduction and life-making is. So it is the activities and institutions that are required literally for making life, maintaining life and generationally replacing life. Life-making in the most direct sense is of course giving birth, but in order to maintain that life, we require a whole host of other activities such as cleaning, feeding, cooking, washing clothes. There are physical institutional requirements, a house to live in, public transport to go to various places, public recreational facilities, parks, after school programs. So schools and hospitals are some of the basic institutions that are necessary for the maintenance of life and life making. Those activities and institutions that are involved in this process of life making we call social reproduction work and social reproduction institutions. But social reproduction is also a framework. It is a lens through which to look at the world around us and try to understand it. It allows us to locate the source of wealth in our society, which is both human life and human labor. The capitalist framework or the capitalist lens is the opposite of life making. It is death making because it is about making of things or profit. Capitalism asks how many more things can we produce because things make profit. The consideration is not about the Im impact of those things on people, but to create an empire of things in which capitalism is the necromancer reigning supreme. Most of these activities and most of the jobs in the social reproduction sector, like nursing, teaching, cleaning, are dominated by women workers. And because capitalism is a thing-making system, not a life-making system, these activities and these workers are severely undervalued. The coronavirus crisis, the reason I'm talking about this framework is because it is very significant to understand this framework to understand the current uprising. The coronavirus crisis has been tragically clarifying in two respects. Firstly, it has clarified what social reproduction feminists have been saying for a while, which is that care work and life making work are the essential work of society. And in the US, um, even today, there was a report in the New York Times that one of the things that we see through this crisis is most of the essential work is done by people of color in this country. And this is why the, the virus is raging in the um, communities of color because they're essential workers and cannot afford to stay home and had to go to work. So um, under lockdown, nobody said we need stockbrokers and investment bankers, let's keep those services open. They said, let's keep nurses working, cleaners working, garbage removal services open. The crisis has also tragically revealed how completely incapable capitalism is of dealing with a pandemic or the fallout from the pandemic. The greatest victim in all this are not the, uh, according to the uh, capitalists, not the countless lives that are being lost, but the economy. The economy, it seems, is the most vulnerable little child that everyone from Trump to Boris Johnson is ready to protect with shining swords. Meanwhile, the healthcare sector has been ravaged in the United States by privatization and austerity measures. People are saying that nurses have to make masks at home. So 
I have always said that capitalism privatizes life and life making, but I think we need to reward that after the pandemic and the uprising. Capitalism privatizes life for sure, but it also socializes death. So what do we mean by death making and the significance to this uprising? So first of all, I wanna share with you a personal anecdote. I did not grow up in the United States. So I was very shocked when my two-year-old went to preschool several years ago. She was only two. And one day we got this notice saying um, that a very special community activist was co community worker was coming to her preschool to talk to the children. And this community worker was a cop, a police person. And I was absolutely horrified that someone with a gun was coming into a classroom full of two-year-olds and presenting their work to these kids. The capitalist state tries at every step to thus normalize its violence and its violent agents. Dead children in bombed cities are dubbed collateral damage and violent men with guns, the police, are anointed community helpers. At this moment, the public school systems across the country, you know, institutions of life making, are forecasted to have up to one trillion dollars in budget shortfalls. But in the past 30 years, police spending has grown by 445%, according to the Justice Policy Institute. This funding boom is happening even though, according to the FBI, violent crime has steadily decreased since the 1990s. How much we spend on police is even more staggering when you look at it at the city level. My city of you know, 100,000 people, mostly students, we leave our um, doors open at night, uh, unlocked at night sometimes. My city uh, police department has a tank. It is proudly parked in uh, front of the police station. In Oakland, California, 41% of the city spending goes to policing. In Minneapolis, where George Floyd was murdered, 36% of the city budget is for the police. So let us concentrate for a moment on that fact that violent crime declined while the power and budget of the police increased. How do we make sense of this? Here, we have to be grateful to abolitionists, especially black abolitionists, who have offered us years of careful research, activism, and analysis to help us make sense of this strange fact. According to Critical Resistance, one such abolitionist organization, I really urge you to look them up. It's, it's a wonderful uh, resource. Uh, Critical Resistance calls policing a social relationship. What that means is that although the police departments are tangible brick and mortar institutions and buildings, policing itself is a collection of various practices that change over time in order to do the job that the police are supposed to do under capitalism, enforce law and social control through the use of force. What does this mean in practice? It means the state and the police propping up that state decide on what acts are criminal. They can thus invent new criminal offenses every day. For example, and I love this one, derelict vehicle in the driveway. This is a crime. This crime cost Louisine Hoskin, a black woman in Ferguson, $1,200 in fines. This is where scholar and abolitionist feminist Ruthie Gilmore's seminal formulation on care work and policing is vital to understand policing as a social relationship. Ruthie urges us to understand why what she calls organized abandonment by the state 
has to necessarily pair with organized violence by the same state. In other words, when the state defunds healthcare, closes hospitals and schools in communities of color neighborhood, when they consciously refuse to investigate whether the drinking water supply of a community has been contaminated, this organized abandonment of the community must be kept in place by organized violence. So policing need to penetrate areas of social life, schools, hospitals, parks, which as life-making institutions ought to have nothing to do with the death-making institution of the police. Disciplining of communities of color, instilling fear and introducing violence into the lives of young black children thus gets woven into the fabric of social life. This is why anti-racism must be a conscious element to our struggles for life-making or the expansion of our life-making institutions such as schools and hospitals. Many people in our labor movements and on the left have called for more money for schools and hospitals as opposed to jails and police saying these are universalist demands that will benefit everyone. So Medicare for all is a universalist demand. And of course, we support that demand. We support these kind of universalist demands. But if we do not make specifically anti-racist demands, then we forget that people of color in the US have been consciously left out of the social contract. So moves to just consolidate that social contract through simple demands like more schools fail to get at how deeply racism is seeded in the workings of capitalism's, at capitalism and its death drives. Consider this, often it is through a school, a life-making space that is supposed to nourish and excite a child's creativity that a black child first comes into contact with the criminal justice system. So we cannot simply say we need more schools. We need to make these schools also true spaces of life making by having anti-racist demands in place. So this is why a new initiative began by nurses called the Nurses for Racial Justice which is about the kicking police out of hospitals is such an important initiative. Death-making institutions such as the police should have no space in our communities and movements if we want such spaces to allow life and life-making to flourish. This is why I think we are right now looking at new leaders emerging who are reformulating and refounding insurrectionary care, what I call insurrectionary care. And they're fighting tirelessly to uphold the right of the working class to life and life making over the right of the state to kill. That's what the uprising stands for and something that we should support unconditionally. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, then, um, Eric, I think it's your turn. So feel free to go ahead. Uh, thank you. Let me first say that I uh, appreciate this opportunity to speak to comrades in Europe, uh, definitely in Belgium, about the situation in the United States, particularly this uh, latest movement and what it represents. Uh, I've been involved in the black movement, labor movement for 50 years. So I've seen many things since the late 1960s. I originally come from Detroit, Michigan, where at the time I became politically active, was the center of a, uh, a very uh, powerful intellectual black movement in the auto plants, the car plants, organization called the League of Revolutionary Black Workers. Uh, also the Black Panther Party was there and other organizations. 
Uh, I became a socialist at that time because I understood what I think we're beginning to see now, that in a country that is overwhelmingly non-white, I mean white, at the time it was 80%, now it's 60%, that to win freedom for African Americans, you needed to have allies, which mainly meant among the white population, uh, as well as other minorities, Latinos, Asians, Native people, uh, and, that, and that you couldn't go alone, uh, even in all Black organizations, nationalist organizations. What's unique about this uprising, and this has only been going on for four weeks, in truth, since Floyd, George Floyd was uh, murdered by the cops, uh, is that the movement here, and I think it's also, I see it in Britain, I see it in parts of, in France and other parts of Europe, is that you see a movement that is raised in a man against racism that is being supported by other groups, other nationalities, particularly in the United States by whites. Now this is different than I've ever seen before. That is, you've always had white allies, even in the civil rights movement in the 1960s. Uh, but what's different is that, that while Black people have always uh, responded with rebellions or riots or whatever you want to call them, I agree with uh, Peter about uprising. What's new is that this movement within days brought out hundreds of thousands of whites in our towns. Uh, 2,000 cities and towns across the United States, all 50 states, including states like Alaska, Wyoming, many states that are predominantly, you know, white, very few African Americans. So for that to happen is unique. Uh, I live in Northern California because I'm, I'm a retired uh, airline worker, and my community is only 25,000 people, and we had protests in our town, and we had Black Lives Matter signs go up. Uh, and, and, and it was a surprise to me, to be honest. I didn't ex anticipate it. It's only about 2% African-American in this city. So it was a surprise, but that's happening everywhere. In fact, some parts of even California, you have protests that were organized in rural areas where there were no African-Americans, just white people came out and carried Black Lives Matter. Now this is very, I, I say this is significant because there's an understanding, especially among young, young people, especially uh, young whites, that this is their issue. Uh, African Americans have always protested police violence. It's not new. I mean, you can, every year someone gets murdered by the cops, you have protests, then nothing happens, the police get, a, they don't even get arrested, they don't get indicted. The most that can happen, and this is the trick of the ruling class, They'll let a family sue the city, the police, and then give them money, okay, which is paid by taxpayers. So that's what happens. This is unique. This movement is not going to end, in my view, anytime soon, because the uprising is touching on deeper issues of, uh, of racism, but not just racism, but the ideology of white supremacy that's behind the racist ideology in this country. As socialists, as Marxists, we understand the class and class struggle. We understand how capitalism works and how they use divide and rule. In America, though, the origin of uh, capitalist domination and convincing white working people to support white rulers against African Americans, against Native Americans, against Latin Americans, against other people is the ideology of white supremacy. That ideology is, is, is especially was used after the American Civil War and the defeat of what was called Reconstruction and the creation of a segregated legal system, we called it Jim Crow, that convinced poor whites that they should align themselves with white uh, employers and white rulers against African Americans. They, and that's still an issue to this day. However, this new movement since George Floyd's death has won many thousands of whites, even in the southern part of the country, to support the movement. Now that's new, because in the civil rights era, in the 1960s, when Martin Luther King uh, and others were against that legal segregation, they, the protests were overwhelmingly black. 
you know, you had some whites, but what you see today is different. And that's the reason the ruling class is concerned. Now the ruling class as a whole is, uh, is divided on this issue. Uh, the, the, the ones who are smart <laughs> like to contain the protests. That's the people who are saying, let's have reform of the police. And some city and states are trying to get rid of like chokeholds and other items because uh, they fear the movement will go beyond uh, minor, modest reforms to revolutionary reforms that is actually abolishment of the current police system, which is what I support. You need to abolish it and create something new. A completely new safety type situation, you have to create it from the bottom up. And a lot of the left wing of the movement, that's, that's their view. When they use defund, that's what they mean. They don't mean just take some money and shift it to schools or hospitals. They mean radically reimagine what policing is. Now, let me just explain the origin of policing as far as this country goes. The actual police force was created because of slavery. Okay, slaves were first brought to the United States, well, we weren't the United States, but British colony in 1619. Now, slavery, the, 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 they needed a police force to deal with the, the runaway slaves, to deal with the keeping that property, because slaves were property of the slaveholders under control. So they, can, they organized slave patrols. Those slave patrols then later become, over time, uh, different names, but the police force. And the main purpose of that was to protect, you know, the property and value of the capitalist class or the slaveholders. But the, 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 it's important to recognize that policing origin was always reactionary and it was always uh, had a particular form in the United States, which is directly connected to protecting the property of slaves. So when the American Revolution happened in 1776, against the British, the one thing that what we call the founding fathers never touched was the issue of slavery in their documents. They don't even mention the word because they had an alliance with slaveholders. And slave, slaves even existed in, what, in the northern part of the country. So that was understood. The concept of, uh, of, of, of the, this country was based on only rights for the black, uh, whites, and white men in particular, but whites. Uh, slaves were just viewed as a way to give the Southerners, slaveholders, more representation in, in, in our Congress. Now, that continued to this day, in truth, the way this country was structured. But the police force began with around protecting the slaveholders, protecting their property. And then, you know, the police concept continued to expand until, the, you know, the rise of the labor movement and unions first in the railroads in the 1880s and 90s up through uh, the 1930s. So the, the, the police were always an arm of the state against workers and against uh, black people. So uh, that's not new. What's new today in this uprising is what I explained, the uh, white allies in particular, white seeing, yes, I begin to understand what black people say about police, that is, Black people know in this country, and Latinos too, Puerto Ricans, Mexicans, that when you see police, you want to get, get away from them. You want to walk away. You don't want to have anything to do with police because you don't know what they will do. White people, on the other hand, accept the, the false premise that they serve and protect them, which is actually true for the most part. They don't go into white areas and just immediately start beating you up and stopping you for jaywalking you know, or, or, or if you're sleeping in your car as what happened in Atlanta, Rayshard Brooks, he was sleeping in his car and then he's dead. That, that's not typical for white Americans. So what was new, as I said in the beginning, is that a lot of whites for the first time began to understand, oh, Black Lives Matter means Black lives up to now have been sub, or didn't matter. Okay, it did not matter. So now, it's understood what that slogan meant. And they began to join the protest, which is why we actually have a discussion for the first time again. This is not a new discussion among African-Americans, but a 
or a lot of whites, what about reparations? Now, reparations was an idea that comes out of the Civil, uh, civil War, because after uh, the former, after slaves were freed, they got nothing. Think of yourself in servitude, you are free, you have no house, you have no land, you have no money, and you're supposed to survive. That's what happened. Abraham Lincoln, who was the president, said, and others said, well, once you're free, we'll, take, we'll, we'll get you some compensation. There was a slogan or idea that uh, former slaves should get 40 acres of land and a mule. That was the idea that you should be able to survive. That never happened because after Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, the vice president was a, a basically a racist, reneged on any promises. And this is a very important point because from that point on, when blacks were put in the constitution and blacks were not in the constitution up to 1865, uh, which is why African-Americans never really celebrate 4th of July, which is a, Independence Day for everyone, for whites, not for blacks. Uh, it was really 1865, what was called June 10th, 10th uh, that just happened recently. Uh, the reason why this was an important date, it opened the door to real equality. It was slammed shut within 10, 12 years because the Northern Army, the army that won the war, left the South and gave the government in the state back to the white slaveholders, even though they were no longer slaves. And that led to a situation of 100 years of what we call Jim Crow, second class status, that was not only in the South, but throughout the North. That if you live in the North of the United States, if an African American, you were segregated. Like in Detroit, where I grew up, we were black people were segregated in parts of the city. You couldn't live in other parts of the state. You couldn't get certain jobs. That's what it meant. And that it didn't change. The civil rights movement in the 60s opened the door to give legal equality, but didn't settle all the issues. And I'll give you one example. Uh, uh, Americans, many people are believe, and maybe people over in Europe have the same view, uh, that uh, the, the president of FDR, as he's called, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, opened up a new deal and gave a lot of rights to minorities or working class people. What people don't know, it excluded African Americans. <laughs> Most of the new deal did not apply if you were black. You didn't get what they, even after war, when soldiers went to war, blacks couldn't get the loans. They were only for whites. Every, every, almost everything that happened in this country excluded blacks. That only began to change in the 1970s, but then we had a second counter revolution like we had after the Civil War, where they tried to roll back those changes. So you've been, it, th this has been the tug of war. So when, when you have protests like we see today, there's this understanding of that history and understanding that really we've never got any equality. What's new again is that the fact that so many young whites recognize it and think something should change is the big worry for the ruling class. Now, let me just say, when I said the ruling class is not united, well, President Trump does represent a, a wing of the ruling class. That wing of the ruling class wants to reverse everything that was won since the 1960s in this country. Yesterday, Trump issued what we call an executive order that he would put military force to protect Confederate ma monuments and other monuments, dead people. He said, that's a priority. We need to put down this uprising. He, he even said, he referred to the protesters as thugs and terrorists. Now, does he have the ability to do that? Not as long as the movement, it's a mass movement. And I don't think he's gonna try anything except in Washington, D.C., because Washington, D.C. is not a state. It's a territory. So in, in the United States, if you're a territory, you don't have the same rights as you have in the 50 states. So he may try something there, except it's a majority black city. So how far he will go. But the tug of war is real. There's a wing of the ruling class that would like to put this down and go back to the way it was. There's a more astute group of people who see 
that it could cause a bigger explosion. Now, if this was just African Americans protesting or Puerto Ricans or Mexicans, that, they, they would not be worried. They're concerned because of this broader alliance and the broader struggle. And that's where the issue is. I personally think it's going to continue at least through the presidential elections in November, maybe beyond. There will be some real ref uh, changes to police uh, in some cities. We'll see. San Francisco is talking about it. Seattle's gone the furthest. Uh, even New York State and New York City have done more than they ever done. But you got to, th th that's going to be the fight. That's a battle. Will not be settled in elections. And we, we will see how far, how far this battle goes. But I think that the, as long as this alliance stays firm, uh, gains can be won. But there will be the counter force. There will be the reactionary force, not just Trump, the, the police. Let me just say on the police unions, uh, something I've written about. Police, I don't consider the police union unions, which is the starting point. You, you, you cannot do what the police have done, and this is true all over the world, It's not just in the United States. The role of the police is the arm of the state and the arm of the employing class. Because they organize a union and take that name doesn't make them part of the labor movement. The union, the concept of unions is, is to serve working workers in a factory or, or even a government office to protect their interests. The purpose of a police union is to protect the criminals who work as cops. Okay, They call it a union. I call it a cartel, more aligned with the drug cartels. But that's what the police unions are. A lot of labor organizations, AFL-CIO in this country, accept the labor unions in, into the House of Labor. They should be kicked out. And there's a current of people on the left who think they should be kicked out. It happened in Seattle. It was a close vote, 55 to 45 percent, but it happened. It should happen everywhere. Now, that's going to be a fight because the labor movement is, is relatively conservative in this country. So most of the labor leadership still supports police unions in, in, in the labor movement, which is wrong. And most of the, most of the labor, organized labor, except the left wing, like the nurses union in New York, California, uh, some of the uh, state employee unions have actively supported the Black Lives Matter movement. But overall, the labor movement has always tailed behind the mass movement. They don't lead it. Rarely do they lead it, but they support it when they have no choice because of their members. And that's still true today. That's why the new leaders, and that's very important, there are new leaders coming forward. They're not the old civil rights leaders. They're not the old... Uh, old time labor leaders or elected officials uh, of the liberal wing of the Democratic Party. They're people on the streets. They're creating new leaders. And this is very important for us because that's where you have to get the leadership from. They are taking over. They're not following the leader of these groups. These, the, the government, the Democrats are trying to catch up to the real leaders because they want to slow it down. And that's what's happening. But the real leaders are, especially from the Black community, let's use the name Black Lives Matter because they take different names in different cities. They are way beyond these leaders. Their attitude is, this: you don't win by elections, you win by struggle. And they understand that. Now, as socialists, that's what we've always understood, but this is even more important when you see it taking place in, in a new movement like we see today. So I, I just want to... Uh, emphasize that this struggle or uprising, uh, even as the media tries to focus on other issues, is very deep as long as this alliance is there. Its relationship to the pandemic and other issues is not new because the economic status of minorities in this country has always been as second class in the economic field. Black unemployment's always historically been twice as high as white unemployment. Uh, uh, the, the minority workers, uh, what, what people now call essential workers, still are way underpaid and have very few rights. And even as some people say, oh, they're essential, they still don't want to pay them. <laughs> they still do not want to change their status. Uh, so that tug of war may influence what some unions do, but the bottom line is 
The racism because of the ideology of white supremacy is still deep, it's cracking. I think the next phase will be fighting for real reparations, however that's done. There are a lot of people who understand that, that the issue is not individual whites, but it's the system. And I think that's a very important change and under political consciousness that's, that's taking place. So there's a lot taking place here. Uh, like I said, I've been very happy to pleased to see a similar phenomena in Europe uh, because of your status. I mean, Belgium, France, all these countries have their own minorities face racism too. So this is very important that this example is spreading around the world. And uh, I think it's very important to build an international uh, working class movement, anti-racist movement, and of course, the socialist movement. I'll just leave it at that. Thank you very much for your intervention. Um, so yeah, um, just to reiterate, uh, if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask them. Titi uh, Malik, I, I think you now have each five minutes to react to each other if you wish to, if you have anything to, to remark about others' points or uh, want to discuss something, feel free to do that. In the meantime, people can still continue to ask questions. I don't know if- I have no, I, I agreed with the general points <laughs> that were made in my comment there. Uh, some of this, I haven't read her magazine or the magazine, so I need to get that information. Uh, so I can submit an article. <laughs> but uh, I know, I, I, I think we're both in the same, we're thinking along the same lines which I think is important. Yep. I just want to say that I really appreciated Malik's setting up the historical context, you know, so um, it was really, really useful. And I think it'll be useful for comrades everywhere to know this sort of easy transition from safe slave patrol to current day uh, police that, that the disciplinary measures made under capitalism, how easily they kind of fit together. So I really appreciated that. Thank you. Okay. Um, if there's nothing else, uh, I think we can start with the questions. So the first question by Fanny, um, what are some of the police reforms that are being discussed right now in city councils? Um, isn't there a risk when we try to make new police forces that they will just take on the old shapes that we just tried to destroy. Uh, I think this is more a question for Malik, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Uh, the, the fight, the battle to change or reform the police is just a stepping stone to more radical concept of what policing should or shouldn't be. Uh, there's no, if, if you have a reform of the police that say, for example, in chokeholds, chokeholds, which is what killed George Floyd, mm -hmm. uh, that was it, it would come back. And the reason I say it would come back because in New York State, New York City actually banned the chokehold years ago. And then it was used against Eric Garner six years ago and he was killed and nothing happened to the cop. He only lost his job last year. <laughs> he was never arrested or prosecuted. So a simple reform will not solve the bigger picture. However, if you make, and this is a, my, the main point, you don't demand a modest reform, you demand radical change, which is why I support abolishment. Get rid of it and recreate something new, which would include involving the community itself and how to create it. For example, most of the people who call for even defund or dismantle the police, they forget to add one important point. Police should live in the community that they police. So if you live in a black or Latino community, the people who police it should be from there, should be trained. They should have a say. Most police, like in Minneapolis, all that budget, 36%, most of the police don't live in Minneapolis only a small handful. So they go in as an occupying force, then they go home. Now, if you force police to be re-registered to follow certain standards, which is how it should be done, and you change the policing 
not just their tactics, but you make it possible that you have to live there. You have to have an independent police review board that makes decisions of hiring and firing. And you have an independent prosecutor, which they will never allow, by the way, I'm saying this, but they would never allow because it would change the whole concept of policing. But individual decisions, yes, they won't last. They can't work. And let me just say the Democratic Party and the, the House and Congress, they just passed a list of reforms, which include things that are positive, but they don't touch on this main issue I just said. They don't touch of restructuring, get rid of old police, abolishing and starting from scratch. They don't say they have to live in the community unless, and they don't have an independent review board that hires and fires. Well, unless all those things happen, yeah, they're cosmetic, they could be positive for a while. But our demand is to say the problem for a radical abolishment of the police gets people to think about why it won't happen, which is the capitalist system itself. So as a Marxist, as a socialist, I say I see it as a politicizing process that will go further and you demand the maximum. So whatever reforms you win, they, could, they will be positive, but it doesn't solve the problem unless you go beyond the system as we have. Yeah. Uh, I just add to that a little bit, um, completely agree with what Alex said. So first of all, we have to understand uh, that the Democrats are the leading flank in trying to uh, co-opt this movement. Okay, so the Democrats have basically shared this exact same fears as Jeff Bezos and um, Republicans, that this will go beyond reform and turn into revolutionary demands. And but their policy is to contain. So Joe Biden, the you know Democratic nominee, has advocated three hundred million dollar budget uh, increase for the police because the problem apparently with policing is that they're not trained properly. So if you just train these killers properly, they'll just do the job. So three hundred million dollar increase to policing budgets is Joe Biden's solution to this. This is the same man who says, uh, you know, uh, bullets, uh, rubber bullets are fine, just, just aim at their legs, you know? So that's the protesters, you should aim at their legs. So um, we have to understand something. I, I don't know how it works in Belgium, but in the United States, the police don't do the things that most white people think police do right? The police, most of police work is not, you know, apprehending Jack the Ripper or, you know, some uh, great serial killer. It's mostly responding to noise, parking, um, sometimes domestic violence. None of these, um, so in a recent research, it shows that um, in California, in one year, the police made one felony arrest. So, you know, Contrary to all these television programs where you see the good police constantly chasing bad criminals, the police actually are not, for most of their work, is not catching violent criminals. Most of their work is, A, expanding the notion of crime, as we talked about before. So, you know, parking your car in the driveway is now a crime to brutalize uh, black people and maintain order in that real sense of capitalist order. So that's their job. And most of the work that they actually do, you know, noise responding to, you know, your, uh, you know, music is too loud or something can actually be handled by trained non-police community interventionists, right? Like, do you really need a white man in guns to come and intervene when your male partner is engaging in uh, domestic violence in your home? No, what you need is a trained, uh, you know, counselor or community activist who actually has uh, training in domestic violence, who has training in uh, rape counseling and so on to enter your house and intervene in that. You don't need a man with a gun, okay? So that's the first thing uh, to keep in mind. The second is reformists and liberals are trying to make the demand of defund into a mere budget cut, right? that all we need to do is cut the budgets of some of the police to make, uh, you know, sort of um, 
those cosmetic kind of changes that Malik talked about, that we ban chokeholds, but of course they come creeping back and so on. So some of these reformers are basically saying that. Abolitionists and socialists are saying something completely different. That defund is basically a transitional demand. When we are saying defund, it just doesn't mean, you know, a, a budget cut to the police. The defund is the beginning of actual abolition of the police. Okay, and the and when we say ab abolition, you know, the word sounds like you're taking away something, but it's actually building something in these communities, right? That when you take away the police, you actually build community and you build social relations in these communities. So the money going into schools, hospitals, parks and schools, hospitals, and parks free of police are actually going to build community relations rather than policing relations. So it's very important for us to not let the reformist wing uh, and, and the liberal wing defang this demand for defunding, okay? It is a defund demand that should be seen as a transitional demand rather than a, a demand for a mere sort of cosmetic changes on the, uh, you know, sort of structure in order to, and, and it's very much, you know, I agree with Malik that it's very much a politicization demand. If we say ab abolish the police, that brings up entire questions of the roots of police violence, the roots of capitalist violence. And it's a fantastic demand uh, when we say abolish the police to politicize a new generation of activists. So I think um, there's a really, really good article by Marian Kaba in, in, uh, in the New York Times a few days ago that I urge people to look at. Um, where Mar Mariam is a long-standing abolitionist uh, activist, where she talks about what she means by um, abolition. There is a fantastic article by my friend and comrade Robin Kelly um, in the New York Times again uh, two days ago, which is about you know how this society is more interested in um, protecting property than protecting life. So, I mean, there, there are some very, very uh, crucial analysis that's coming out of the movement right now, and we cannot lose this momentum. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, next question is, what do you think of the images of cops who are supporting the Black Lives Matter movement? So you see some cops taking a knee, taking a stand, um, which is especially shocking for the person that asked the questions, since they, attract the attention on themselves, showing that it's just a few bad apples in the police force and not a systematic problem. Um, how The question is, how can we counter that false idea that it's just the question of a few bad apples and not a systemic structural problem? Uh, let me just say, uh, that's a very good question because part of the propaganda from the uh, reformers or the government is this idea that only a few police are bad. My position is uh, the police, by definition, are all bad. And we need to say that. We have to stop saying there's, this is about a few or accepting there's a few bad police. Think about it. The, the way policing works, and, I, and this is true all over the world, the police work as, as an organization that disciplines itself. So if you, if you are a cop, and like what happened with George Floyd, there was supposedly at least one of those four cops who didn't like what was going on, but he understood to be a part of the police force, you had to, a group, you had to support each other. And they call it a blue wall of silence. They be quiet. Now, if, if, if you understood the, the concept of uh, crime, if you go, uh, you, you're a getaway driver at a bank, they charge you with the same crime as the people went in the bank to rob the bank. Well, that's how I view police. They may kneel to try to pretend they're with the, with the protesters and they support them, but if they didn't speak out against the cop who carried out violence, then they're just as bad. Which is why, and, you know, I may write about this in, uh, I haven't written, I've written a lot about the police question because I think it's important. But 
you have to start explaining why all cops, by definition, black or white, in this case, are not good, because they go along with their policies of the police department, the police union. They're not good cops. If you go along with it, you're just as complicit. So they kneel for the same reason a Democrat or Republican politician says, yes, yes, you have a, a problem because black lives do matter. But they're just trying to contain the movement. They're trying to stop the movement. And you have to say, no, if you really believe in stopping this, you need to, I would say, the first thing I would say, okay, are you willing to be re-registered to see if you meet our new qualifications to be a cop? You would have to re-register every police in every city to see if they meet the new criteria. If they don't, they, got, they have to go. Now, none of them will agree to that. They can't agree to it. But that's what we, we cannot accept that that's a, po I don't consider it positive when they kneel because I know why they're doing it. And so you have to say, okay, fine. Are you going to go arrest that other cop who didn't kneel? Because you know they obviously don't agree with you. Now, I understand that that kind of discussion you can't have on the street because they'll probably uh, hit you. <laughs> they'll probably attack you. But for us as socialists, we have to understand that the police cannot be reformed. And true. They do have to be removed, and, and the whole concept has changed. In the, in the history of the revolutionary movement, that's why we, we can't, the, the, the early Marxists didn't, they changed the names. You call them committees, you call them Soviets. You changed the names of the new institutions that you were trying to create. You didn't accept the old institutions, you created new. That's what we have to do with the police. Um. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. The police, uh, I mean, if there was any uh, thing to judge the police by, you should judge it by the fact that no one has resigned out of the sheer brutality that has been exposed. People are resigning because attention is being drawn to the institution. People are, police officers are saying that we can't do our job properly anymore because there's too much criticism of our work. So this is the reason they're resigning right now. So that kind of exposes the ultimate morality of the police that unless you let us do our job of brutalizing populations with impunity, we are going to take our ball and go away. So this is the institution we're talking about, right? So them kneeling, I think, is tremendously disrespectful. It is sly and cunning. And I agree with you when you say, you know, how do we counter it? I think we counter it by having conversations right there, you know, with our comrades with whom we've been to the protest to draw attention to the fact that why are these people kneeling? Were they kneeling when Colin Kaepernick knelt those months ago? No, they said that Colin Kaepernick was being uh, disrespectful to the flag. So now they're kneeling because the pressure is high. This is not just opportunism, it is disrespectful to the movement to have these killers adopt, try to co-opt our symbols and our practices. So I think we should absolutely reject that. Okay, um, just a quick intervention. Um, the person who asked this question, please also try to be civil. Uh, there's no need for insults when you're making your point. Um, you'll know who, I, who you are. Um, but the question was, if you defund the police, who will protect you? Uh, when there's a question of lethal assaults towards one of your family members, who do you call? No community member should ever be trained to interfere in a crime. So, yeah, I That's think a, just, just to say on that question, I mean, that comes up here all the time. Yeah. What happened? And the, the bottom line is you, you, the, the concept of rebuilding a new kind of safety forces, which is what I call it, would, well, it doesn't happen overnight. They don't just happen. It, it, would be a, it, would, it would be a process. And a lot of what you need, you would have other means of protecting as like domestic violence which has been on the rise in the United States, women being uh, facing violence in their homes uh, because of the uh, epidemic and the pandemic and, and so on. Uh, 
how you solve that is not with the police force. How do you solve issues like that? You have to create something new. But I'll give you, I'll be very, the, the question was asked, would I call, if someone burglarized my house and leave, would I, would I think about calling the cops if they've already left? And then you say, call the cops to do what? I myself would probably wait till the morning to call and put a report and call my insurance because the truth is I would be worried that if I call them at night, they would shoot me mm -hmm. okay? because that's happened. Okay. When I have a traffic incident, I don't call a cop. I get the information and then I call, I may call the police to say this happened. Here's the information. But the typical non-white person thinks about this all the time. They don't just, they're not just saying that. Most of these functions, you don't need police. You report a burglary, you don't need to call an armed person. Now I understand, I don't know, I, I can't remember what the situation with police in Belgium, you, do they still, do they kill carry guns? I don't know. Maybe the police in Belgium are like Britain where they have separate armed units from the, from the local police. But in the United States, everybody carries a gun. All the police carry guns. You, can, you have to be worried if you call a, a cop and you're in the black community, they're gonna think you were the burglar. You were the person who carried out the action. So, you know, if you create the right movement, you will create your own police force. I'll get, uh, just to make this point even uh, more, uh, the, we're all familiar with the Kurds in Syria, in the uh, Kurdish movement, where they have been brutalized by the Turks and everyone else in the region, the Iranians, the Syrians, the Russians. Now that movement, which was created, uh, the Kurdish Workers' Party and all them, they set up their own policing force in Syria. Mainly, that movement mainly led, a lot of them mainly led by women, by the way. Now they created their own police force and they functioned differently. And, and most people on the left don't follow that. But actually I consider what they've done is an example of what should be done. What kind of functions they set up is what should be done in most countries. My point is they, didn't, they had to create it. They had to figure out to deal with these kind of issues in, the, in their own community. It's not that difficult to do if you have the right concept. If we do it in the context of now that you suddenly abolish the police and there's no one to call, that means we didn't have a movement, right? You, it, it assumes that nothing happened to get there. We have to get there through a mass movement where you create the institute, new institutions simultaneously. That's how it's always been in revolutions. You create the new as you destroy the old. So that's how it would work. If you take the case of rape, the current system of the police responding to cases of sexual assault and rape just hasn't worked. Two thirds of rape in this country, as well as globally, are actually not reported, okay? When rapes do get reported, most people complain and of the process of reporting and how the criminal justice system uh, uh, treats uh, uh, the survivors and uh, reporters. Additionally, police officers themselves commit sexual assault alarmingly often. Um, a, a recent studies to 2010 found that sexual misconduct was the second most frequently reported form of police misconduct, right? So this this institution is not an institution that can help solve the problem of sexual assault, domestic violence, or rape in our society, okay? Uh, the idea when you say that a society without police, most white people think that when we think of a society without police, we are thinking of a society that has you know, devolved into lawlessness and they feel scared. But police do not ensure safety in any community. And this is what, you know, both of us have been trying to imp impress through this uh, conference, that police do not bring safety in a community. What brings safety and prosperity to a community are life-making institutions, hospitals, schools, 
proper jobs, high wages, unionized workforces, um, you know, those um, uh, no disparity between male and female uh, work and wages, those are the kind of things that bring safety to a community, not the police. Um, and so uh, 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 a member of this institution, a member who can shoot to death an 11 year old in a park playing with their toy, that is not an institution that can bring safety to our neighborhoods and to our communities. So we have to reimagine safety is not ensured by putting people in cages. Safety is ensured by investing in the community in working lives. And that's what creates safe communities, not police. Yeah, thank you. Um, so next question. Um, would it be possible to talk more about the specific role of women in the uprising? And then also, uh, I'm going to ask a few questions in sequence and feel free to answer the first one you, you feel interested. Um, is there a national coordination of the Black Lives Matter movements? Um, could you talk a bit more about the blind spots and claims like universal Medicaid? Uh, if you don't have an anti-racist approach when um, talking about universal Medicare. And um, is there um, a question of racist justice, is the question of racist justice also raised in the Black Lives Matter movement? And if it is, how is it envisioned to, to tackle that issue? I don't know if you've heard all the questions. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let me just say one point uh, on, on the role of women. Most people may or may not know that the Black Lives Matter movement was actually initiated by three Black women. It was three Black women who took the lead to create uh, eight years ago after the most recent round of murders, Trayvon Mountain, Martin in Florida. And uh, uh, they, cre they started it in... in uh, they have played a prominent role in local group. The Black Lives Matter has their own national website, but basically it pops up in different local communities. You know, whether they call themselves Black Lives Matter, Black Lives, another name, uh, they, they laid out a vision in most places, just follow it and create their own program. But uh, <clears throat> the, the role of Black women has been very prominent in general. That's a whole issue that needs to be discussed because historically black women have played prominent roles throughout the civil rights and black liberation movement, but never got the, uh, never got the recognition they deserve. But I think now they're getting more recognition because more advances in understanding about the role of women in general. But uh, the, the black Lives movement is more a concept that everyone picked up on because they understood it. And they, and they in, in, in local groups just take up the banner. Uh, there's no national coordination in the sense of an organize, organized structure, but there's a national idea of ideas and concepts that people follow and, and agree with. Uh, so that, that's what I would say on that. And, and uh, I'll let you know, she speak to the other issues. Right, so as Malik said, uh, the three women who started it were Patrice Kugler's, uh, Alicia Garza, and Opal Tomati. Tometi. And uh, this, um, this phase of the uprising, what is very significant is not just uh, the, the role of uh, women, but also how the uprising is centering some really important gender issues. So for instance, in Brooklyn, one of the largest ma uh, marches was Black Trans Lives Matter, okay? It was just a fantastic display led by Black trans workers and uh, trans women, um, especially given the attack of the Trump administration on trans people. So um, the, the, the Brooklyn March was um, huge and really angry and really wonderful. Um, the other significant fact about um, women in the march, uh, in this uprising is 
how many high school girls are organizing these demonstrations in various towns. I mean, it is astonishing how multiracial it is, but how multi-generational the marches uh, and uh, uprisings have been. Uh, some of the leaders of the uh, uprisings have been house, uh, uh, high school girls. So this is, this is a tremendously important development in the history of US uh, uh, social movements and anti-capitalism. The question of national coordination is quite important. Um, one of the things to say is just because there is no central body like SNCC or um, you know any of these um, uh, previous uh, iterations of black uh, uh, organizations does not mean that the protests are disorganized. The protests are extremely well organized, very well coordinated. However, as Malik pointed out, what there is missing is a national coordination body. So for instance, these three young girls organized this fantastic protest in Philadelphia, but they're not necessarily connected to other high school girls in, let's say, uh, New York or LA, right? So that is something that uh, if the movement sustains, which I hope it will, will, I think, emerge out of the movement, the need for a national coordination, the need and, and, you know, organizations come out organically out of social movements. So I'm sure something will arise. But I mean, we should focus on the fact that these are not unorganized uh, movements. They're very deeply organized and very organically rooted in these cities and, and communities. The Medicaid question, you know, and um, so those of you who followed the whole Bernie Sanders um, trajectory, you know, I was going to vote for Bernie. There is no question. You know, I, I think he's a social democrat. He's probably more right in the uh, social democratic sort of spectrum than, say, Jeremy Corbyn in Britain. But I was going to vote for Bernie. Um, knowing you know, his role in US imperialism, et cetera. The reason I was gonna vote for him was because he was um, representing a particular movement, a trajectory, a social um, longing, okay? And what I was gonna do is, you know, if I door knocked for him, then I was going to use that opportunity to build campaigns in my local area, right? So, however, one of the things that Bernie insisted, and a section of the left in the US insists, is that Medicare for all, uh, hospitals for all, and so on, those were the important movements of our time, not reparations. So Bernie was asked this question directly. Uh, do you support reparations? And Bernie said, no, I do not support reparations. Instead, we should have universal social democratic programs like you know, Medicare for all, that's gonna lift uh, a, a big tide lifts all boats, right? So that's the, that was the approach. And this is unfortunately the approach of a wide section of the US left, okay? And I don't agree with this approach, I'll be very honest. The reason I do not agree with this approach is, as I said in my talk, black people and people of color in this country have been written out of the social contract. The, the New Deal, as Malik pointed out, was especially and consciously left out domestic workers and, and, and people who worked in, um, in agriculture, okay? Who were these people? People of color. Okay, so the New Deal was this great thing that lifted all boats, but it was specifically excluding of people of color. It was specifically excluding of women. So uh, rights that came naturally to men, women had to apply for those programs and so on, right? So unless we weave in anti-racist, 
anti-sexist specific demands, then this question of universalism actually is something that we are hiding behind, okay? Because universalism under capitalism does not mean universalism. It still reproduce or can reproduce the dynamics of race and gender um, inequalities in that society. So our universalism must be attentive to the particular. It cannot be the universalism that capitalism gives us. We must create a revolutionary uh, universalism that incorporates anti-racist and anti-sexist ideas. Uh, so there were two other questions. So the question of racial justice, um, how it is addressed in the Black Lives Matter movements and the debates and perspectives of left-wing organizations in the USA, if you have any um, input on that. Well, that's a little more complicated in the sense that uh, <clears throat> the racial justice term Everyone's for racial justice, okay, on the left or progressive movement. But then you have to get, what, what do you mean by that? What kind of demands are you making to uh, end uh, the injustice? So here, I'll give you an example. Joe Biden and a lot of the Democrats supported uh, a, a major crime bill that, uh, the, that Hillary Clinton got hit hard by because Bill Clinton, then president, supported more uh, incarceration of black people. Uh, when he was president. The mass incarceration is a big issue for minorities in the United States. Now, th that's where a lot of, you know, we have, we have more people in prison than probably all the rest of the countries in the world combined. Because that idea of, uh, of justice meant you get all criminals in jail, which made overwhelmingly African Americans or Latinos. Uh, and then you can't have racial justice unless you get rid of that kind of system, criminal justice system. Uh, the one thing, the, the, so that's an issue. How do you, a lot of the blacks don't just talk about police and police brutality, they talk about the prison system. We have an prison industrial complex. So the fight over racial justice includes the, the criminal justice system, the prison system, and a lot of liberals don't see it the same way. Therefore, reforms instead of rather, uh, demolishing a lot of the prisons. So it, it's a debate. The problem on the socialist left, I'll just follow up on this point, is that historically socialists have always assumed that if the class struggle would resolve race issues, socialists have always historically believed in, the, definitely 100 years ago, they saw the issue of race and racism and, and uh, solved by you know, working class unity, and that would overthrow these problems, not just for a race, but also for women's rights, too. So you subordinate the individual issues of uh, racism, it could be resolved by a working class movement itself. Uh, and that's proven to be, of course, not true, because of what I call the, the, uh, the white ideology or white supremacy, which most Marxists don't, we never talked about, because we assume the class struggle will deal with the issue. In fact, if you don't confront work, the source of the racism in this society or any society, it's hard to get working class unity except for short periods of time. I mean, you can get working class unity if it's a strike over wages, but to get working class unity on the race issue or racial justice is not as simple. You have to take it head on, which is one reason the reparations issue is important. So the left is still debating what that means. I consider the police issue one way to confront it because if you think police are a union, you're not confronting racism, in my view. You have to confront why do you think all unions are, are the same and, and they're not. So um, that, that, that's an issue. I, I, I think the problem for the left, and I think it's less so today because people are more conscious of anti-racism. You know, you have to be active against racist and racist policies to build the movement. Uh, but anyhow, I, I think it, you know, the mass struggle always resolves most of these issues in the process because everyone is more open to discuss these ideas. When there's no struggle, it's an academic debate. When there's struggle, it's practical because you have to take a position. You have to take sides. Um, 
I was going to ask you, I was the moderator, you know, what, what, you know, what is the significance of the movement in Belgium to get rid of King Leopold and his statues and his signs? Now, King Leopold, people in Africa know what he did in the Congo. But what's interesting to me is that you see protests inside Belgium against all his monuments. Now, did that just happen? Or is it, it, to me, it happened because people began to relook at their own history. Yeah. So um, I, I, I just want to say um, two things. One is that, uh, you know, this question of the, the criminal justice system is very linked to what capitalism needs, right? So we cannot think about um, uh, what, uh, what can be achieved unless we think about the dominant need for capitalism in order to maintain profit, in order to keep uh, racialized people in place, that it needs this particular form of the criminal justice system. Otherwise, can you imagine how in um, the US with crime going down, you have police force and a budget and strength going up. I mean, it makes no sense unless you think about that. So that's the nature of the um, uh, criminal uh, justice system. The second thing I wanted to add to what uh, Malik said was that, you know, uh, the, the, um, the justice system is uh, like, for instance, with the Democratic Party, you have people like Kamala Harris, who Joe Biden was considering as a, a, a running mate for vice president for him. Now, Kamala Harris is a black woman, and she speaks the speak and um, about, you know, racial justice or whatever. Um, but she is a prosecutor. So she was for years of her life in California, determined to actually keep the criminal justice system in place. Okay, one of the laws that she passed, and this is very significant to, you know, questions of um, life making, one of the laws she advocated for was a truancy law, that if uh, children had missed school for a specific number of days, then the parents could be apprehended by police, okay? So what families do you think uh, are most likely to come into that dragnet of criminality, right? So it is going to be uh, poor families and families of color. So this is something um, uh, Kamala Harris pushed for. So we cannot just say that, you know, uh, Black um, uh, uh, using the black power uh, sign or whatever is actually in itself progressive. We have to look at, especially if it's coming from the maws of the Democratic Party, what these people's history have been, what kind of laws they advocated for, and whether they're going to be useful for this movement. I would much rather be led by those three young girls from Philadelphia, you know, multiracial, three young girls from Philadelphia then be led by Kamala Harris, even though Kamala Harris is, is Black, right? Um, this last thing I will say is, this is a generation that has come after the vicious murder of Trayvon Martin, the, um, the, the, uh, the series of uprisings that followed the killings in Ferguson of Michael Brown, Freddie Gray, Eric Garner. This is not a generation that is going to accept capitalist bullshit on anti-racism, okay? It just isn't. It has been steeled in the fires of this uprising and others. It has been burnt by the crash of 2008 and now the crash that is coming again of, of 2020 and 2021, okay? So this is not your uh, generation that is going to accept a Kamala Harris or a Joe Biden. What they can do is still out in the future and in the making, okay? What our job is as part of the movement and as people who are now older is to actually um, instill this sense of 
history into the movement that the 16 year old may not have had. And it's to actually support unconditionally in our speaking and our writing the movement, because this is where the future of the United States is going to be rebuilt, not in the elections that are going to be held in November. Yeah, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, just one last personal question. Um, is there also a lot of, um, because we've seen the Black Lives Matter movement has had a large impact, I can speak for Belgium itself, where we need to confront our own imperialist and colonial history actually, um, which has re-sparked the debate, not only about uh, King Leopold II, but also about what we did in the Congo. But we also see that in Great Britain, which now talks about the racism of Churchill, about statues like uh, Colson. Um, in France, the same thing about Algeria and other countries. Um, is there also a large part of the Black Lives Matter movements that's trying to confront the history of the US explicit explicitly, if you see what I mean? Well, yes. I mean, the, the reason that Trump issued his executive order yesterday, Friday, was because it's not just and the movement is not just going after uh, Confederate monuments and names. Uh, in Minneapolis or St. Paul, the capital of Minnesota, uh, the Native uh, American indigenous people took down a statue of Columbus. Uh, and that's, and many people are want to remove Columbus statues. And that's been a debate for many years. The Indians have always understood it, but other people didn't. And, uh, you know, Italians say is Italian heritage, which, of course, that's as much better Italians you could honor <laughs> than uh, Columbus. Uh, there's discussion about, well, Theodore Roosevelt statue uh, the, in New York. Um, so, yes, there are other images that are being attacked, uh, historical uh, placards and signs. And I think the ruling class would be more than happy to compromise on Confederacy, but they don't want to compromise on this other history that is also racist. So I think that's going to continue to build up the movement because part of American history is in the schools is revisionist. It doesn't tell the true story. The, re the revisionist history is not just about the Confederacy and slavery, it's about many other issues. So we see a lot of uh, you know, reckoning of this, of this history. And a lot of challenges to it. So uh, I consider, and I, to me, that, that shows the power of the movement because it's gone beyond its original demands to, to look at everything. And I think that's true in many countries around the world. The same thing is beginning to happen. And that's a very positive sign. So I'll just end by saying, you know, um, the the first president of the United States, uh, George and uh, Martha, his his wife, George Washington and Martha Washington owned 300 slaves. OK, so this is the historical legacy of this country that the first president owned 300 slaves. Look, so did the second president. Um, so um, and Andrew Jackson and so on. So this is a slave owner's nation and the history of this country, uh, the wealth of this country is built on settler, settler colonialism on the one hand, that's how they got the land and the wealth was built by um, slavery. So uh, the uh, genocide of Native Americans and the enslavement of people of African uh, origin is, is the basis of wealth of this country. So that is a history that is being confronted now. I mean, the, the monuments and so on can be symbolic as it were, but actually people are reckoning with these his, this deep historical legacy. You know, racism is as American as apple pie and root beer in this country, right? So it is a absolute American institution. And this is something that black people and people of color have always known, but now white people are coming to understand it in, in a systemic way, uh, thanks to the uprising. You know, one of the things that I was so thrilled to hear was that they wanted to take down Mount Rushmore, right? What a grotesque a symbol in this country of, you know, carving your president's face onto a rock face, like really? Um, and so that, 
So this is, uh, you know, um, my comrade and hero, Angela Davis, um, went on television recently to give an interview and um, um, Amy Goodman from uh, Democracy Now! asked her, do you think there's going to be a truth and reconciliation uh, process like South Africa? And, um, and Angela said something that, you know, has stayed with me. She said, well, truth, yes, but I'm not sure how quickly or urgently reconciliation is possible, do you know? So this is something that I think we have to keep in mind. We have to bear in mind that people of color in this country have been brutalized and uh, dispossessed for the entire history of this country in order for some of those wrongs to be righted, there needs to be a root and branch change in the social order. And such a root and branch change can never be achieved through elections, can never be achieved through charity or for ind by individual goodness. That can only be achieved through mass movements. And that's what we need to support. Okay, thank you. Um... I'm gonna, if you have any concluding statements, feel free to make them now. And I think then we'll, then we'll make an end. Uh, Malik, do you have? Well, no, I, I think we covered a lot of ground. I mean, the only thing I would suggest to people who are listening to this, uh, I, do, I do two columns. I do regular articles on Against the Current out of Detroit, uh, but that's every two months. But I've, I've been writing for an Australian newspaper, Green Left, weekly, greenleft.org.au, on the current developments. And so if anyone, and they're on the website. So I write almost every week about what's going on uh, in Green Left. The Australian paper is one of the biggest in Australia on the left, and it gets around Asia. So uh, I, you know, if readers are interested, they can look at some of this stuff. Uh, but I'm more, you know, I like I said, I, I, the current environment. I, I'm more than willing to contribute to others, other papers, other publications. I don't really care. I think it's important to get out information about these issues. And I don't know what your paper is in Belgium, but I could write for you guys too. I think that's surely be interesting. <laughs> yeah. So just let me know. Uh, and like I said, I really, I think this was a good meeting, a good forum, good discussion. And I, th I think it's valuable that that we as socialists uh, discuss, exchange ideas, and uh, you know, leadership does come from those who have a far-seeing view. So we have an important role as socialists in this movement, uh, as well as activists. So I really appreciate it, and the other speaker, of course. Yes. So um, I think we we'll, we can conclude. So thank you both of you very much for. Uh... A really interesting talk. I mean, I've learned a lot personally. I think most people here also learned a lot. Um, I also would like to address, uh, well, first of all, also thank you to the translators for all the work. I mean, that's a hell of a job. I've tried it once, <laughs> not that fun to do. Um, the 1st of July, we also have with the Gauche Anticapitalist, for those who are interested, um, a debate with economist uh, Michael Hassan. Uh, together with rethinking economics through the economic crisis. Um, so if people are interested in that, feel free to go to the Gauche Anticapitalist page. And um, yeah, it's, I think one last word, uh, just like you said, Malik, it's important that we keep on discussing these things, keep on exchanging information, learning about each other and each other's movements. Um, so yeah, always feel free to reach out to our organization to each other's organizations and uh, keep the discussion going thank you very much everyone and uh, i hope you have a good night you too good night bye